Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and Jerry's here too. And this is Stuff You Should Know, the We're All Melting edition. Yeah, I'm just a just a migrating fern. Oh, that's a good one to be. Blowing through the of the forest, uh-huh. looking for a, a new home. Sure. I'm a spore. What happens when you get there, spore? Well, I'll probably grow into a beautiful new fern because ferns are pretty hardy. That's awesome. And I'll bet you'll contribute uh, to society in all sorts of beneficial ways that <laughs> ferns that were already there couldn't necessarily do. I hope so. There is fern stuff in here. And uh, I have a wonderful fern scene at my camp. Uh on the other side of the feeder creek that goes into the main creek, I call it, I even have a sign that says Fern Forest. Mm-hmm. And it's a forest of ferns. It's quite lovely. God knows where they're from because those things can travel quite a bit, as we'll see. Yeah, they could be from uh, from from Alabama. Easily. I'm not kidding. Easily, man. I've got a stat that's going to blow your mind in a second. Uh, oh, boy. Actually, I'll just bust it out now. You ready? Yeah. Yeah. How far can a fern travel? A fern can travel, the Tasmanian tree fern in particular, can send its spores 500 to 800 kilometers. It's 300 to 500 miles from the mother plant. And get this, a single frond, a frond, Mm -hmm. produces uh, more than 750 million of those spores. Wow. So you can understand that ferns, I mean, you find ferns everywhere. They're really hardy. Um, they can actually survive cold, colder temperatures than you would think. Mm-hmm. They also thrive in the tropics. They're like a really great pioneer plant. They usually are among the first large plants that show up in a, like a, a newly cleared part of Earth, right? This all makes sense then. Okay, so what we're talking about then is that those ferns that showed up in this new place and said, hey, let's get this, let's get this biosphere going again. Let's get this biome back into shape yeah. after this wildfire or something like that Mm -hmm. Um, or there's like a stampede because there was a really great ice cream truck that drove through one of those two Mm -hmm. Um, those ferns have migrated they came from Tasmania apparently all the way to wherever the ice cream truck was and now they're there Uh and so they actually moved in that sense which is really surprising because plants are what are known as sessile organisms they don't move from place to place individually as organisms but as a species they can actually move around like inchworms pretty pretty good yeah it's pretty cool i, I didn't really know much about this uh, we're talking about plant migration and the idea well not idea the very real fact mm-hmm. that uh, just like uh, humans and animals mm-hmm. will go to more hospitable climes as the climate may change or just i don't know uh, just to seek a, a better place to be plants and trees and things on mass do the same thing. Yeah, and there's um, all sorts of ways that they do that too. They so they do it by dispersing their seeds or their spores in that case. Fern spores are single cell organisms. They're not not like a seed technically, but they do the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. They show up in a place and set up shop and they start rocking out. Yeah, that's right. And and ferns, you know, it depends and we'll get all into this stuff. But how fast this happens depends on different factors. Uh, How far these plants can migrate depends Mm -hmm. on different factors. Mm -hmm. Um, Why this is happening is generally climate change. Yeah. And plants and trees and things are generally moving north uh, or up in elevation if they hit mountains. Or south in the southern hemisphere. Exactly. Exactly. so that's sort of the general pattern. And we mentioned ferns because, like you said, those spores can really haul. Uh, ferns also mature very quickly. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the wind can just that's – why I got, that's why I got a fern forest at my camp probably. Yeah. So they, they check both of the boxes that you need to be a fast migrating plant species. They produce um, seeds or spores at a very young age. And their seed or spore can travel very far distances, right? Right. So they can move around. And also, it doesn't hurt that, like I said, ferns are adaptable. The trees and other plants don't move quite so fast. But they move, especially if you look at the fossil record, a lot mm-hmm. faster than they actually should. So if yeah. you pay attention to a single organism, say an oak, 
those acorns don't travel terribly far. They may get a little further away from the drip line if a squirrel happens to bury it somewhere and a new oak tree grows. Sure. I think um, it was Anders Sandberg who described acorns as solar-powered factories for producing more oak trees. Whoa, whoa. Andy Sandberg said that? No, Anders Sandberg. Oh, okay. He's a philosopher at um, uh, Oxford. Uh, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Andy Sandberg, he ate his lime accidentally in his Corona bottle. That's the that's what he's got. You know who he's married to? Uh, Patricia Arquette. No. It's not Roseanne a bad guess. Arquette. You've been guessing Patricia Arquette for a lot of things lately, I feel like. Have I? Uh, he, he's married to, yeah, I feel like that's come up before okay. recently. Right. Maybe, I don't know. Her name just rolls off the tongue. I know. Uh, a big fan of hers. Uh, he is married to, what's her name? Joanna Newsom, the singer and harpist. Oh, neat. Oh, he's and culture, if, if you right? like, if you're into architecture and homes, you should seek out, uh, I don't know if it was Architectural Digest or something, but some someone did a spread on their home. Uh, and it is really something else. Okay. So that's Andy Samberg hour. Yeah. yeah that's that we just checked off. A quick detour. Uh, wait, wait. I wasn't done. Oh, no. Go, go ahead. So if you look at an individual tree, an oak mm-hmm. tree, those acorns don't go particularly far away from the tree, mm-hmm. as the old saying goes. But the fact that they do fall away from the tree means that very slowly some of those seedlings are going to grow up a little more northward or a little more southward than Mm -hmm. its mother plant. And very, very slowly, the whole group of oaks can move southward or northward, right? Uh, Over hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of years. So long. The thing is, if you look at the fossil record, they move way faster than that, than than they should. And there's actually a paradox that was named by a guy named Clement Reed, right? Mm -hmm. Reed's Paradox. Yeah, he's got a great, great title for it. Of rapid plant migration. That's the full title. It sounds almost like snake oil from the 19th century. Yeah, it kind of does. <laughs> so what is it? Oh, okay. I didn't even set setting me up. <laughs> uh, we're s- still tight after all these years. For sure. Uh, so what he found from the fossil record, like you were talking about, and as we'll see, that that's one like you know pretty good way to study this stuff, mm-hmm. especially pollen fossils, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they're so hardy. Yeah, so he saw that trees were migrating a lot faster uh, than, like, the rate that you would think. And so he, like, uh, those oaks, I think, was uh, one example you gave on the British Isles uh, after the last glacial period over a span of, like, 10,000 years or so. They traveled about 600 miles, and it would normally take about a million years if the, ste- if the seeds were just dispersed in a typical way. Right. But what he figured was that, uh, what may be happening here is like uh, some weird weather event happens mm-hmm. that sent things much farther than usual mm-hmm. or like some deer or something eats uh, something and then poops out something r- really far away from where it started. And so all of a sudden this animal has spread it via their poo-poo. Right. And this this is how like large scale migration r- happens or I should say rapid migration over long distances, right? Right, yeah. It's the it's the unusual, not just the acorn falling and hitting the ground. It's not just gravity-assisted. It's animal-assisted, which is called zoochory, or it's wind-assisted, which is called anemochory, or water-assisted, which is called hydrochory. Um, and that's just the way that some plants disperse their seeds that's kind of on top of the normal way they disperse it, which is just dropping it from their leaves or the spores blowing on the wind, which I guess is one type of quarry. Yeah. So like if a squirrel loaded up its mouth full of things mm-hmm. and somehow found its way into your camper as you set off for Arizona <laughs> That from would Georgia, be a freak event, sure. <laughs> and it probably wouldn't be en masse, but, it, you know, that's a way a tree could move. All it takes is that one that one oak to make it. Sure. So to, to just survive and then it starts its own new um, part of the range. Yeah, absolutely. And we also uh, should point out, when was uh, when was Reed doing this? This is a, a while ago, like 100 plus years ago, right? Yeah, he, he was a, ge- a geologist. I don't know if we said, but his um, Reed's Paradox of Rapid Plant Migration came out in 1899, and it was a smash hit. Yeah. So people, I mean, for at least that long, science has been sort of curious about this uh, 
this migration happening at a rate that they would not expect. Right. The thing is, is that's really hard when you throw in that X factor to calculate how fast an actual species can migrate. Um, and there's a few ways that you can study that kind of thing. Um, one, as you said, is studying the fossil record, which is super helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not showing you what's going on contemporaneously or within the last couple of decades. This is 10,000, a million years ago, something like that, right? Yeah. So if you wanted to study something a little closer to home, uh, timeline, uh, timeline wise, you would maybe set up what's called a permanent vegetation plot. Mm -hmm. So you would just you would mark off an area. And you would go back there, you know, every so often, like every six months or every year or so, and just sort of chart what's happening. Uh, that's one really good way. I think uh, they've been doing this for about a, a hundred years mm -hmm. uh, since the 1920s. So we've got a, a pretty good data set there. Um, something else you could do is go somewhere like let, let's say you dug up some cool uh, scientific uh, journal from a scientist from, you know, 200 years ago that went and explored some island and while they may not have, like, charted everything out exactly like you would in today's science, they may have a really nice diary about all the plant life there and things that they saw there and where it might be. And you could go back to that place. And it's not quite as tight of a record, but you could still get a pretty good idea of what's happening. Yeah, depending on whose journal you're working from. And back in 2012, a Danish team of scientists followed the record left by a 19th century geologist named Alexander von Humboldt from Germany, who was just an interesting dude in and of himself. Yeah. He, he called coffee concentrated sunbeams, so he's my <laughs> kind of guy. Oh, man, that's but great. They went um, back to Chimborazo Volcano in Ecuador, which Humboldt studied in detail. And not only did he study the vegetation there, and he classified all sorts of new plants that Europeans didn't know about at that point, mm -hmm. he also noted exactly where they were on the mountain as far as the elevation went. Super helpful. Super helpful. So based on this information, the 2012 Danes were able to go back and, and recreate his trip. And then they were able to note what plants were where. And they found that everything, all species on average, had moved up the mountain by about yeah. an average of about 500 meters, mm -hmm. which is significant. It's like um, almost a, a mile. It's like eight tenths of a mile. Yeah. Yeah. That's the average. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of variation within that, but that's yeah, it's a long way. For sure. And what we found out, and I guess this comes up a little later, but uh, a plant can find more hospitable climbs uh, going up 500 meters than they might by going, let's just say, north, like 90 to 100 miles. Yes. So like a much quicker road to uh, better climbs mm -hmm. if you just go up that mountain. For sure. Yeah, that's kind of two ways they move is um, l l uh, longitudinally Yeah. or altitudinally. You got to be in shape, though. Oh, for sure. If you're going to climb that mountain. <laughs> uh, should we take a break? Uh, I think we should. But just to wrap it up real quick, there's a bunch of ways you can study the movement of trees. But it's so slow and it happens over such long timelines, longer than a human timeline, that yeah. it's harder to do than you'd think. But we still have figured out some ways to do it. All right. We'll be right back, and we'll talk about all this stuff in more detail right after this. One other way we failed to mention, probably would have been better to just say that before the break, but again, <laughs> still learning after 16 years. Sure. Uh, satellite images is another way that you can study on the short term. Uh, you know, the fossil pollen is much longer mm -hmm. and those uh, plant plots and things like that, vegetation plots are, are shorter term, but satellite images can also help. Yeah. If you want to catch like a, a Venus flytrap in the act of leapfrogging over mm -hmm. some other plant, a satellite yeah. image is going to help you with that. The fossil record <laughs> won't show you that. Uh, here's the thing with all this, though. It's not um, like we're going to talk a lot about climate change because that's what's spurring a lot of the movement right now. But the Earth's climate has changed a lot over the, you know, over the years. And this is not some new thing. There used to be uh, periods of time where the Sahara Desert was quite green and there was grasses growing there and tropical plants growing there and 
elephants roaming the Sahara and wildlife living there. And they've learned that this is actually uh, one of the things that helped move, you know, uh, humans around. Like humans could actually migrate through the Sahara with with, uh, much more ease than they could before during these green Sahara periods. Yeah, that's so fascinating that, you know, who knows when we would have migrated out of Africa into Europe in the ages had the Green Sahara not happened. Isn't that just nuts? Yeah, like hundreds of miles, it says here, that they would find tropical plants growing where they shouldn't be growing Mm -hmm. alongside, you know, the the desert stuff that survived. So that was this weird sort of mixed up biome for a time. Yeah, in the Green Sahara period, there were a few of them that have been documented, but they figured out that they happen about every 23,000 years. Right. We're due for one in about 12,000 years, something like that. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's based on the tilt in Earth's axis. Um, that's neither here nor there, but the point is, is during these, um, these periods where the Sahara was just a humid kind of tropical forest, Mm -hmm. um, there was a mixture, kind of what you touched upon of different, like you said, a hybrid biome of stuff that wouldn't necessarily live together under normal circumstances, but got along just famously in the couple thousand years that the Sahara was green and those plants were growing together. Yeah. It's just amazing to think about. And then in North America, we have another example, too. Um, After the Laurentide Glacier, um, which is way up in the Arctic right now, used to Mm -hmm. be down in Indiana and northern New Jersey. Yeah. And when it retreated, it took everything with it. Um, It took boulders. It carved out lakes. It did all sorts of neat stuff. But what it didn't leave behind was vegetation. So it left – it was like a, a giant ice cream truck, basically. Yeah, It left nothing behind, and it was just a great place for plants to, to pioneer and colonize. Yeah. I mean, that's why you have pine trees in New Jersey, right? I would think so. Yeah, or in the south because they were too far. They, they, they were trapped below – or yeah, below the Laurentide um, Glacier down in the southeast, even though they normally would have been growing in the north, Right. And as the glacier retreated, the climate changed in that area, and so the trees just moved on up. So that's an example of migration as well. Yeah. Oh, wait. I thought they, I thought they were. It was more hospitable in the south for these trees, mm-hmm. and that migration sent them north. Yeah, that's what I said, right? Oh, okay. I'm pretty Maybe I sure. heard you wrong. Yeah. Um, the other thing we should talk about, as far as climate change goes, because like I said, we're going to mention that a lot, is. The uh, rate of change of the climate right. is increasing, as uh, most people agree on. And that is kind of where we are now in discussing this is like, is uh, the rate of climate increasing too fast for the plant migration to catch up? Or in some cases, are the uh, plants migrating a- ahead of that pace? Mm-hmm. And that's really sort of, uh, you know, a lot of this episode is about this rate of change uh, in the 200 years since the beginning of the industrial age, no coincidence, uh, the the temperature of the earth has increased more than one degree. Celsius, and again, right? Yeah, we, we, we all know now that, you know, one degree is like a huge, huge deal. It's 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but 0.37 of that change over the past 200 years has come since 2011. Yes, dude. So it's, people have, uh, you know, Someone has stepped on the gas here, yeah, and it's happening much, much faster, and it seemingly, in many cases, fasting uh, faster than these plants can catch up. Yeah, so plants are used to migrating, like they've been migrating throughout Earth's history, but these conditions are different. It's not like it was before, even when the Earth was heating up after the last ice age. I think, yeah. did you say that it, it took about an average of uh, 1,400 years to increase by one degree after the last glacial period? No, no, that was the setup that would have been very helpful, actually. (laughs) I mean, think about it. So we've we've achieved one degree in 200 years. And after the last glacial period ended, uh, the Earth heated one degree every 1,400 years. Yeah, that's called a rapid increase. Yeah, like you said, somebody's put their foot on the gas, and that somebody is um, Western industrialized nations, right? Yeah. So that's that's one thing that's really kind of putting the, the heat on plants, literally, is their southernmost ranges or their northernmost ranges, depending on what, uh, what um, I guess their equatorial pointing ranges, the, where it's hotter. Yeah. Those are the ones that are really at stake. So are those plants' ranges big enough that they'll mm-hmm. be able to survive that change in climate and just keep moving northward? Or are they going to be outpaced 
by the movement of the climate because the climate is racing toward the poles just like the plants are, right? Yeah. So who's faster? Well, it turns out um, if you talk about New England's trees, they move something, I think red oaks is what it was that this uh, University of Vermont group was studying. They move something like a tenth to three-tenths of a mile a year, right? Yeah. The climate is moving something like four to six miles a year. So the climate is really kind of showing up as kind of the who Usain Bolt of right. <laughs> of this race, and um, I don't know the the plants are like me racing Usain Bolt. Yeah, that lab group in Vermont, they all have T-shirts that just say "You do the math." <laughs> exactly. It's very smarmy, but they get their point across for sure. Um, there's another example of, and you know, we kind of been talking about northern uh, northern movement. Uh, which is generally the pattern, but not always. Um, there's a researcher at Purdue named um, Songlin Fei. I think Fei or Fei? I don't know. F-E-I. I bet it's Fei. Um, who studied 86 species of trees in the eastern U.S. over about 30 years from the mid-80s to 2015. Mm -hmm. And it depends on what the tree is. Uh, hardwoods, uh, scarlet oaks, red maples, um, magnolias are moving west uh, at about one and a half kilometers a year. Uh, because the Midwest is becoming more wet and the conditions are good for those trees to grow. Mm -hmm. um, softwoods, um, shortleaf pines, red pines, bald cypress, they're actually moving north about a kilometer of the year, uh, a kilometer a year. So uh, different plants and trees are moving in different directions at different rates. Yeah, it's very much akin to a neighborhood that's um, this old settled in neighborhood with a bunch of mix of people. Mm -hmm. That's being gentrified. It's being pushed out and separated. Not everybody just, the whole neighborhood doesn't just move. This neighborhood breaks up and goes in different directions. Yeah. And so to ecologists and arborists, like this is very concerning because for a long time, we've looked at groups of plants as communities. Like some, mm -hmm. some plants go with other plants. Like I think, um, what is it? Beech and uh, hickory? <laughs> Where is it? I don't know. Oh. I like hickory though. <laughs> we can't we can't leave that in there. Oh yeah, hemlocks. I knew it was an H H tree. Yeah. Beech and hemlocks go together like peanut butter and chocolate. Mm. Um so too do like firs and spruces, right? So when you yeah. find one of these, you usually find the other one. And there's also a bunch of other plants that kind of interact and usually some types of animals that hang out in those same types of forests. So if you've got the hemlocks going north and the beach going west, who are the hemlocks going to mix with and who are the beach going to mix with when they start to set up these new communities? And that yeah. was really troubling to ecologists. But I think palynologists, these fossil pollen scientists, have said it's always been this way. Communities aren't permanent. They're kind of mm -hmm. instable. They just seem permanent to us because our life years uh, or our lifespans on the the order of like 70 80 years right right this is much it's a much slower process but it's a constantly changing turnover um so it's not that big of a deal but again because of the pace of climate change when these hemlocks get further north and the beach get further west they're going to have far less time to develop new connections and networks with the new plants that they set up communities with yeah. And the other thing, too, you know, earlier when I mentioned that a, a, a series of trees might move um, up a mountainside mm -hmm. uh, because it's a way quicker way to get to a more hospitable climate than moving the, that 90 miles north. Yeah. Uh, when they and this happens in, in other cases as well. It's not just like up a mountainside. But when they get to the place where they're going, it, it may be a better place, uh, maybe more hospitable climate wise but other things aren't so great. So if you move up that mountain slope, let's say you have uh, shallower uh, soil. And so those trees move up there because the climate's better, but then they get there and the soil isn't as great. So they get squeezed into where they can grow, maybe into like a tiny little narrow band that's, you know, potentially choking off the rest of the forest. Yeah. I, I figured out it's kind of like hiding in a closet during a house fire. Like, you're going right. to be safe in the short term, but in the long term, it's not a great strategy. But it's not like the trees have any choice. They can't go back down. It's too hot yeah. there. They can't move further up. There's The soil's inhospitable. So they're trapped, and they're eventually going to become a thinner and thinner band until they just pop out of existence. 
That's right. And the other thing that can happen too, when, like you said, uh, when they get to a new place and they don't have enough time to make new friends, um, all of a sudden that can open the window for bad friends to show up. Yeah. And all of a sudden invasive species are there. And then you've got a whole other set of problems. Yeah. The ones that wear like leather jackets with the little silver studs on their shoulders. <laughs> those are the ones you got to watch out for, those plants. Uh, if this all seems very kind of um, on too long of a timeline for you to care, um, first of all, you probably don't care much about climate change because that's the whole name of the game there. Sure. Um, but maple syrup is a good example that Livia found. Uh, Livia helped us out. And she did a great job with this. Um, the maple tree, uh, well, which species is it? The sugar maple is one of the two main species that we use to get that delicious maple syrup. I'm sorry, just as an aside, sugar maple are two beautiful words that form an even more beautiful <sighs> You are right on the money, my friend. You know? Sugar maple. Mm -hmm. That just sounds nice coming out of my mouth. Yeah. Uh, they have been migrating uh, north into Canada, and you might say, well, that's great. Canada is a fine place to live. <laughs> And I'm sure they love their maple syrup there, too. Mm -hmm. But uh, in Quebec, the researchers have found that they're not going to go beyond their current range up there because the their boreal forest up there. So <laughs> the soil, again, they the climate might be better, but then they get up there and the soil pH and the microbe content in the soil is not what they're used to and not what they work well with and grow well with. So they're not doing well up there in the forest. No, no. And that's it's it's the exact same position as the, the trees that are trying to go up the mountain are running into. Eventually, these trees that are moving into the boreal forest areas, they're like they can't go any further. Like they're not adapted to that over yeah. a long enough timeline. Yeah, maybe those sugar maples could like a few of them could land in the boreal forest and end up mm -hmm. surviving in that kind of soil. And then the, they would be adapted for it, and they'd start reproducing. And then as the boreal forest moved closer to the poles or the Arctic, the those trees would move where the boreal forest used to be, right? Totally not a mm -hmm. problem over a long enough time span. Again, climate change has so drastically shortened that time span that there's yeah. probably not going to be time for this. And those sugar maples will just run into that boreal soil and just they they'll, it'll be like hitting a brick wall for their species. Yeah. Uh, another issue that can happen, and I know this all just seems like doomsday stuff. Kind of is. Uh, it kind of is, though. Uh, let's say, uh, like uh, the Amazon episode that we talked about, when trees are moving out there, um, they might be replaced by something. And it may not be an invasive species, but it may just be weeds or grasses or something. Uh, those aren't as good at capturing carbon as those trees were. So then that accelerates the problem even more. Right. Um, and then there's another, if you want to keep talking about doomsday sure. scenarios, um, those boreal forests, they actually are, if you look at a, a map or you, if you look at planet Earth from outer space, uh -huh. they're dark, which means that they absorb more sunlight, more heat, more UV radiation than yeah. the polar caps, the ice that reflects it back into space. So as those boreal forests advance further and further north toward the toward the Arctic or the um, North Pole, and there's less and less ice to reflect it, there's more and more heat for them to trap, which is just going to heat the Earth up that much faster. It's a it's a positive feedback loop that's super duper negative. Yeah, very negative. Um, maybe we should cover tropical things moving north and then take a break? Yeah, because I got some good stuff on that, man. I'm super excited. Yeah, I mean, it goes both ways. So you can have like uh, tropical plants and tropical zones like Florida where, you know, the earth is warming so they can move further and further north. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, these plants that are native to tropical zones are ending up in areas where it's, um, you know, not necessarily a tropical zone. Uh, I'm, I can't remember which zone... Atlanta. Atlanta's um, 7B and 8A. Seven, I love that you know that stuff. <laughs> uh, but the point is, like, these, um, these like, uh, kill, kill frosts that you might get <laughs> that happen to, I love that name, kill frost. Uh -huh. uh, like, it'll get really cold and frost over and, like, kill things maybe that shouldn't be there. If that's happening less and less, and there's even less in the way of those tropical plants moving northward. Right. And so the the... I guess climatologists are expecting that by the end of the century, which seems like a long way away, but buddy, that's like less than, that's like eight decades, 70 something years. 
maybe even 77, you could say, to be exact. <laughs> but in 77 years, climatologists expect all of Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, mm -hmm. Louisiana, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, yeah. and California, I'm guessing the southern half, to be yeah. tropical. Those are subtropical now. If you want yeah. an example of what a tropical um, country is, go to Ecuador. Go to um, Guatemala. Those are tropical. And Alabama and Arizona are going to be like Guatemala by the end of the century. Yeah. That's insane. I know. It's really uh, – and it's happening. It's not like um... – like they, they, they've shown that it's currently happening. Yes. And it's happening because, like you were saying, those extreme cold events are becoming rarer and they're becoming warmer. So the coldest day of the year is not as cold as it used to be, in other words. I think the scientific term is kill frost. <laughs> I love that. That <laughs> is definitely a band name. Oh, for sure. Like, what are they, though? Kill. Oh, um, I don't know. They could be some all kind sorts of heavy of or something, right? I don't know. Remember Destroyer? They were great. They didn't I really, love they had like kind of like a, a belying name. You know what I mean? No, that's true. So it could be like that. I think he named the band that uh, for that reason is a bit of a tongue in cheek thing, maybe. I, I knew I liked that guy. Yeah. Uh, Behar is who we're talking about. Not Joy. Uh, Tony. <laughs> Tony Behar. Todd. No, it's, it's uh, Dan, I think, right? I don't know. I just know yeah. a couple of Destroyer songs. I don't have to know the guy's life story, do I? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Settle down. Uh, no, I wanted to look it up because he is uh, he's also a part time member of uh, maybe my favorite all time uh, band, the new pornographers like modern band. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's he's on most of their albums, but hasn't done the past few. Who was the singer for new pornographers? Was it Nico Case? Well, she sings and Carl Newman sings and also uh, the great Catherine Calder, who is a stuff you should know listener. Oh, neat. Oh, wow. Yeah. Awesome. I found that all out, and I was like, oh, I got to get in touch with her. And I did, and now we are email buddies. And on the last uh, New Pornographer show in Atlanta, she was kind enough to meet me behind the bus, as they say, mm -hmm. uh, in the back parking lot. And we chatted for a while, and she's just wonderful. And uh, she also, I'm going to plug her other band, because she has uh, put out a great album uh, last year with her band Front Person. Mm -hmm. So... Get front person. If you like synthy goodness mm -hmm. and like a beautiful angelic voice, then get front person. Speaking of synthy goodness, that's so funny you bring that up. Just today I discovered an entirely new genre of music called dungeon synth. Have you heard of it? What? No. Okay. Okay. It's the, a really well-named genre, but it is synth. Super like synthy synth, like 80s yeah. kind of synth. I love it. But... The kind of synth that you would find is like the 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 score to a seventies Hobbit like cartoon movie, animated movie. Ooh. It's super wizardy and uh -huh. fantasy. It, it just evokes all that stuff and does such a good job of it. But I, I've only heard one album. I can't remember whose it was. But check out Kill Frost. <laughs> check out Dungeon Synth. Yeah, Kill Frost is a Dungeon Synth band. Nice work. All right, Dungeon Synth and the Front Person album, uh, their most recent one, Parade, is great. Very nice. I think it's Full stop. time for a uh, break. Yeah, let's take a break. We'll be back with more album reviews right after this. So, Chuck, one thing you can say about humans is that we are action-oriented. <laughs> sure. In a lot of ways. I will give it you depends. that we sit around and bicker and and complain and moan and, and undermine one another. But when the chips are down, we can invent our way out of a lot of problems. And invention doesn't have to necessarily mean that we, um, you know, put some metal on metal and made it go on its own. It can mm -hmm. be something like inventing new areas for species that are in danger of, of being lost to climate change to settle and, and make another part of their range out of. Well, sir, it sounds like you were talking about forest-assisted migration. By God, I am. <laughs> That's right. And that is basically, uh, and we'll talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of this, that is human beings, scientists getting involved 
in the ecosystem and nature and spreading seed and sort of getting ahead of the pace uh, if the pace isn't where it should be to keep up with climate change, saying, well, let me give you a little little help forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is can be kind of thorny because it's um, it's humans, like I said, getting involved in the ecosystem in ways that science has long said, let nature work it out. And that's right. the best way to do it because you don't know what can happen once you start messing around. Yeah, like nature finds a way. It does. These guys are saying, the people who are in favor of this are saying, that made sense before July mm -hmm. 2023, which is probably the, the hottest month in Earth's history, at least as kidding. far as since it cooled, basically. Mm -hmm. And that followed the hottest June ever, right? So they, they're these ecologists that are like, no, we need to, to take much more of an active hand in this are saying, like, it's our obligation to do something. Not doing anything is going to be more destructive. It's like saying, like, yeah, we shouldn't move these people out of this house that's being bulldozed over because we don't know what they're going to do in their new neighborhood. So we're just going to stand there and watch them die as the bulldozer yeah. crushes them inside of their house. That's, the, that's an, a pretty good analogy if I do congratulate myself here. <laughs> it's very much akin to that. And so those ecologists have a pretty good point. Like, it's like, yeah, it's not a great, perfect solution, but it's way better than doing nothing. Yeah, but and they're not they're not doing it willy nilly though. They're very aware of the potential uh, pitfalls, like you know, spreading disease and introducing something to an area that could be really bad for other things in that area. So they're not just out there, you know, with a seed cannon blasting stuff all over the place, <laughs> like uh, like Dolph Lundgren or something. Wearing bike coat shorts. <laughs> um, there's a couple of different kinds though. Uh, there's there's uh, forest assisted migration. Mm -hmm. The one that's really sort of thorny is assisted rains, uh, range expansion. So, like, if you're, if you're spreading something within the zone where it might still normally grow uh, in, like, 200 years, mm -hmm. that's one thing. If you're moving something completely out of that range, like, you know, they do forecasting and stuff, and they're like, what might this area look like 100 miles from here, 100 years from now? Uh, if they're moving something completely out of a range that it would even potentially grow, that gets way, way trickier. And I think there's less of that happening, right? Yeah, it, yes, for sure. It, it, like, but th you hit it on the head. They're they're saying like, okay, by 2100, what is this area going to be like? Is it going to be like where these red oaks like to live now in 2023? Right. And if so, maybe we can give them a head start and hope that some of them will uh, survive and adapt and start colonizing there, right? Yeah. It gets even pricklier than assisted range expansion. There's another even more radical one called species rescue or assisted species migration. And that is where you take a, a plant completely out of its normal range, out of what you would even predict would be its normal range, and just move it somewhere it would never be. Right. And this is considered the riskiest um, of the three by ecologists because – you can easily take something that's totally innocuous and benign under normal circumstances and make it into an invasive species when you move it. And the critics of this typically point to the Monterey pine as a good example. Yeah, that's right. It's endangered in California. Mm -hmm. uh, it is native to California, but they have introduced it in Australia. And it's, it's I don't know about wreaking habit, but, but it's damaging the... Uh, uh, it's an invasive species in Australia. Yeah, for sure. They consider it a weed, and when they see it, they pluck it. Um, they do not like those in uh, New South Wales and Victoria, I believe, states. Now that's a weed. <laughs> right. I don't know. That was okay. Wasn't my best. No. <laughs> I'm going to have to agree with you on that. I think you just you just came up with a brand new type of accent, frankly. Yeah. Can we hear it again? No. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to go back and replay it. You know, it's funny, though, is I use uh, my uh, the lady on my phone that talks to me. What's it called on Apple? Uh, Siri. Siri, I guess. I don't use Siri, but I, I, um, I still have a voice for maps and stuff. And I use a – I usually go between an Irish woman and a, a Kiwi, a New Zealander. Oh, yeah. And uh, the New Zealander says, right, and it always cracks me up. That sounds like Matthew McConaughey. It does. At the next street, take a ride. <laughs> I got to hear that. Yeah, I didn't know you could do something word. that G whiz to an Apple iPhone. 
make it oh, talk you like a, some some regular old thing. I don't do you, uh, like sounds. Digital sounds are one of those. Like I don't have misophonia, but if I do, it's for digital sounds. Like when oh, I get a new computer, the first thing I do is turn off all sounds on it. Like any yeah, dings I and do bongs the same thing. have to go. Like I have to change my text sound every month mm. or so because I'll just get like anxiety from it. I can't stand text sound, so I have to come up with a new one. I do not like them. Well, you know what I do is I record uh, I record my own text and phone rings and stuff. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I record my voice. Like when my phone rings, I never have my ringer on. But if it ever does, it's me going, ring, 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 ring. <laughs> That's awesome. And if I get a text, it's me going, text, man. That's great. Yeah, I, and, and I get try. strange looks, but who cares? Can I just use yours? Yeah, well, I'll send okay, them to you if you great. want. Thank you. Yeah, or you can uh, like you can make one specific for Yumi, which is like maybe just her sweet voice saying, "Hello, hello, my love." I used to have a ringtone with her singing that part from um, "What's Love Got to Do with It." That yeah, exactly. Oh, but she just kept <laughs> saying that over and over again. It's pretty great. Oh, I'd love to hear it's that. It's also somewhere. kind of maddening. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it never was actually. I never got sick of that one. I think that says a lot. But it's better than do 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 do. Yeah. Man, you just stressed me out. Sorry. You got anything else? Uh, no, I had a joke about your dislike of digital sounds, but your love of craft work flies in the face of that, but I, I won't even say it. That's more a statement than a joke. Yeah, I, true. But it, it is true. It's quite accurate. <laughs> I think that's it, Chuck. Yeah, I got nothing else. This is, uh, this is a good one. Look out, you know, if you're, in, um, if you're in New Mexico and you see a palm tree growing, then watch out. That's right. It means that you've gone tropical and you're in trouble now. Yeah, not in a good way. Uh, if you uh, want to know more about plant migration, there's a lot of interesting stuff out there on the internet to read and go do that. And maybe go become an ecologist and figure out how to save the planet, please. Yeah. Agreed. Since Chuck said agreed, it's time for listener mail. Uh, this is from William Lloyd. We did a shorty on the NATO um, phonetic alphabet. Mm -hmm. And what we didn't consider was this. Uh, hey guys, being a pilot in prior Air Force, I was glad that you did one on this topic. It's not a correction. Uh, you guys did a good job, but you missed what I think is the best part. The numbers! Uh, the NATO alphabet is kind of a misnomer because it actually also includes numbers 0 through 9, but you can't really make a word starting from a number, so it's purely pronunciation. Uh, most numbers are the same with a notal, uh, notable exception of niner. <laughs> Uh, we use niner instead of nine because over garbled radio, it sounds like five, mm. but mainly because NATO countries speak German, uh, nine oh, yeah. means no in German. Nice. Uh, tr uh, three is pronounced tree, uh, to not be confused with the antiquated prefix uh, sri, S-R-I. Uh, four is two syllable, uh, syllables, rhymes with lower, so you'd say four. <laughs> sounds kind of funny. Uh, to differentiate it from, you know, F-O-R. And uh, five is fife, to keep the word fire distinct in some dialects. Huh. Very this nice. is good stuff. I, I feel dumb that we missed that. Um, that's all interesting, but you're probably thinking, does anyone actually say it like that? It depends. Niner is pretty universal. Uh, plus, we think it, it makes us sound cool, mm -hmm. which it does, of course. Uh, the rest are much less common, but depending where you are in the world and what dialects are involved, they're useful from time to time. Uh, signed, Tailwinds Decker. That's awesome. And also, what a great nickname, too. I hope that's your nickname and your parents didn't actually name you Tailwinds. Well, no, no, no. Decker is the name. Tailwinds was the... Uh, oh, the sign-off? Yeah, yeah. The cheers or the one love? Yeah, exactly. So Decker's the first name. Well, I don't know. It's just Decker. Decker may be a call sign, actually. All right. Well, I, I love that. Thanks a lot, Decker. Much appreciated. I say Niner whenever the occasion arises, you know? I like that. You know, our, our good friend Joe Randazzo, mm -hmm. uh, formerly of The Onion and at Midnight Fame, our, our comedy writer friend, mm -hmm. uh, he signs his emails, uh, yours, with a comma, mm -hmm. Joe Joe Randazzo. That's great. That's very warm. I think yours is, is yeah, it's very, very warm, mm -hmm. as is Joe. Sure. That's perfect for him. And as always, hi to the kids. Yeah. Joe's kids who listen. Yeah, the Randazzos. They're listening family. The Flying Randazzos. They're a trapeze artist family just waiting oh to happen. They should be. Well, we'll see. A lot's going to happen by the end of the century, apparently. So who knows? That's right. Well, if you want to get in touch with us like Decker did and confuse me with your sign-off, 
Uh, I'd appreciate it. So would Chuck, too. He loves that kind of thing. Uh, you can wrap it up, spank it on the bottom, and send it off to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.